Welcome everyone, this is Ryan Hoyme, and I'm the social media director for Bombatel, and today we have Marjorie Brooks. Welcome Marjorie. Hi Ryan. Hi. And we're going to discuss a little bit about client follow through and different kind of things you can do for clients afterwards. Because I think that's where a lot of therapists are, are losing after they're done with the session. They don't know how to kind of end it or what kind of things to recommend to and stuff. So. Well, there's that, and there's like the main thing that I see all the time. Um, basically, we finish our session, and we say, okay, take your time, get up slowly, I'll be in my office, or, you know, open the door when you're ready. But we never really speak with the um, client about how to correct the situations that were going on. For example, a client walked in under a certain amount of tension. We all work under a certain amount of tension. We operate by a certain amount of tension in our bodies. And we come in for a massage or an active modality like stretching. And as therapists, we alter that tension in the body that's holding that body together, whether it's doing it correctly or not. And then we just say, okay, then you do massage, I release everything, just go on your way. But then how do they not repeat or fall back into their old patterns if we don't take the time to correct that? Yeah, it's, it's so easy, it seems, and stuff. And even um, when you recommend the client to get another massage too, what's the easiest way to do that? Well, the way I work with it, because of um, the way financially, the way people are, I when people ask me all the time, okay, so how often should I come back? And they're expecting me, a lot of people are expecting me told, and some therapists take that as an opportunity, oh, I need to see you every week. From my way of saying it is I explain to people that um, it really is their call, but considering their situation, you know, if they're in pain or if they really need to relieve their stress, once a week, once every other week, once a month, but what I highly recommend is that you make the appointment and not wait, because if you wait, you're going to forget to call, and next thing you know, it's going to be six months and you're in a lot of pain. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I remember when I first started um, massaging and stuff, and I was so scared to even ask them, would you like to book another appointment and stuff? And I mean, do, do you see that as kind of a fear for some therapist? Or? I do. A lot of people are afraid to ask for the next appointment, and they say, okay, well, you know, call me if you need me or whatnot like that. And what I, like I said, I always used to ask them, you know, what brought you in here? Why do you think you were under this state? You know, what is it that you need to do to keep out of that state? Is it coming to see me for a massage for the stress relief? You know, is it coming for a stretching session for the pain? I said, but in that interim, what is it that you think that got you into the state? This gives me some time to find out what's going on with them, whether it be physically, emotionally, stress-wise, to give them the tools to recognize that and say, hey, if you, if I'm taking the time to speak with them, they'd be interested in what's going on that got them there, not just that they're a body on and off my table. It makes them want to come back. It makes them want to come back and take a session to make themselves physically feel better because I'm showing them you feel better now because you took time for yourself. You need to take time for yourself on a regular basis. And a lot of people, this they, they won't do it. So you have to really explain to them you need to do it. And is it better right after they're done with the massage or waiting a little while then? Or? For telling them to book another massage? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I let them get dressed and they come in. They'll come into my office, have a drink of water, go to the bathroom, whatever it is that they need to do. And we'll talk for a little bit either about the session or if they were talking nonstop during the session. <laughs> Yeah, the conversation that went on there um, and eventually I'll bring it around uh, to you know would you like to book another appointment I'll just ask I said or, or are we good until you need to call me and I'll, I'll always recommend it they say no I'll give you a call that's when I will always say well that's great I'll be here when you need me but remember if you it doesn't hurt to book the appointment even if you have to change it in the future you know, have it there, it's your reminder, you know you're supposed to be here or you're just not going to do it. So I'll take a few minutes and sit with them and talk afterwards. And do you um, actually send out reminders to them too then or what's the easiest way for them to re remember? It depends on the client. I mean, I have my newsletter as most everyone does these days and their Facebook page that they send out what's going on with themselves. But um, I have certain clients I have to call before their appointment because they otherwise they completely forget and never show up. I actually have it marked in my book, call for a reminder, email the reminder. Um, if I haven't seen somebody in a while, if they don't book an appointment, I usually will give them uh, two months if I haven't seen someone. And then I'll, I might send out an email or give, I'll send out a funny email or a joke email directly to them or maybe give them a call depending on my relationship with them, how long they've been clients. So humor definitely helps them too, and for some. Humor helps everything. <laughs> People live longer when they laugh. 
Three things like necessary in life, and that's laughter, hugs, and a good glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you um? Uh, so with the whole session followed through, do you typically, um, right when you're done with the massage, do you test the joints or anything afterwards? Is that a good idea too? or? With a passive massage, um, I'll, I, I will explain to them how to get off the table. Like I'll remind them, don't just ball up, don't just roll over, make sure you take your time, turn to your side, sit up for a second, then stand up for a second, then you can move. I never just tell it, walk out and someone who hasn't heard much feel, a non-regular client. And say, you know, to take and how to get off the table. Because most people do not know how to get out of bed. They do not know how to get out of a chair. If I have, and, and once they get up and they come into my office, then I'll, I'll go, or if they call me into the treatment room that they're ready, I will go and walk with them. I'll say, let me see you walk. Let me see how do you feel. Where's the pain? What's going on now? If they've come in for pain. If they've just come in for stress or emotional relief. Every time when my client comes in, I watch them walk in, I watch them as they're in the treatment room, I watch them as they walk out of the treatment room so I can assess what's going on. And I might actually have them do something to make themselves more aware of what's going on, like me explaining to them how to get in and out of a chair. I go, did you just see how you got out of that, how you sat in that chair? And they'll be like, no, what? And I'll show them. One of the things that uh, massage therapists really need to do, in my opinion, is to make sure they take some form of body movement classes, whether it's Tai Chi, uh, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, a kinesiology class, we need to understand how the body is supposed to move, not just what the muscles and attachments in the fascia is, so that we can reiterate it, and, and it to our clients. Yeah, and that's interesting about, I mean, we take so many things for granted. I mean, we think the client can get on the table or off the table, no problem and stuff. And But I've had many times when, when I have my business that people have put their head in the wrong area or something, and it's... <laughs> You tell them to lay on their back face up and you come in and their legs over the bolster and you'll come in they'll be face down without the face cradle and uh they're the bolster under their hips and like does that remotely feel correct to you <laughs> yeah. does that really feel right and yeah. like, but no um it is most it's amazing even when i'm teaching classes i do this whole thing i make everyone get up and out of the chair or i ask them to raise their arm to the ceiling and everyone inevitably will raise and they'll raise their shoulder girdle and i said i didn't ask you to raise your shoulder girdle i asked you to raise your arm and we just have taken for granted, even as the practitioner, how we use our body. And unless someone makes us aware of the fact that we're misusing or using it incorrectly, we'll never know that. And our clients certainly don't know that. They don't know how to get up. They don't, you know, they're schlepping the pocketbooks with 12,000 pounds in it, you know, and they just don't realize what the detriment is to that. We all tell them, don't sit on your wallet, you know, your typical basic ones. But we never stop to say, do you know how to get in and out of a chair properly? Or what, how you're really supposed to be walking. Do you realize how you're standing? That, you know, I'll point that out. I'll walk over to a client. Do you realize that all your weight's on this foot? And, get, and you know, my clients, I will make jokes about it, but sometimes they're like, don't look at me. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because even um, for when I was teaching all the years and stuff, too, I mean, I would constantly correct my students what to do, but they would, they would correct me every now and then, and I actually praise them for doing that because they're starting to pick up on, um, different body postures and everything else. So. I make jokes all the time. Like, in, uh, I, it's actually one of the one of the requirements for my assistants in my classes. Like, if you see me slouching or you see me pointed out, because sometimes when I'm teaching or emoting and I'm coming forward or I'm doing, I don't realize that I've lost posture because I'm so involved in what I'm doing. And compensation has taken over, or I'm just standing weird, like you know, from old postures, old habits always come back. You're always fighting old postural habits, no matter how hard you try. It's going to pop back every now and then. And it's the same with the clients. And, you know, we tell everybody how to set their computer and don't slump in your chair when you're when you're at your computer. But we don't take the sign. How many times have you explained to your client how to get in and out of their car correctly? Oh, yeah, just this, <laughs> again, those little things. It's like <laughs> it's little things. When they say, we've all heard, they come in holding their back, barely able to stand upright, and they say, you know, all I did was bend over and pick up the keys. Well, no, bending over the key to pick up the keys was the final straw. But maybe it was getting in and out of the car all cockeyed and grabbing the bags over from the passenger side and trying to get out of the car with everything and stepping incorrectly. You know, it's those basic things. Like, I, I watch my clients. If I have it, I try to schedule, like, half an hour between clients so I have time to have these conversations with them. Uh, and I, I'll walk clients out to their car, and I'll make fun of them getting in and out of their car. I take the extra minute to re 
train them or show them at the very least, you know, you're not doing this correctly. Are they going to do it correctly right off the bat? No, but maybe they'll be more aware of the fact. And if we discover that a certain thing that they're doing, getting in and out of the car, the way they lift the baby, the way they're holding the baby on the hip or whatever it is that they're doing, their sport, that could be the trigger that's building the problem. And, and do they ever give you any flack at all? No, no. And I, I'm very, I always joke with my clients, especially when they're new. I'm like, look, I have a ton of information and I'm going to give it to you unless you don't want it. If you don't want it, just tell me, don't give it to me. I'm not interested. And then I won't. But I will slip it in one way or the other. <laughs> um, because I think that's really, really important. What's the main thing about our health, we always say, is lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. Our understanding is always changing. Look at the big craze with fascia right now. Everybody cannot get enough of fascia, and, and, all, and everybody's seeing all the new things, and everybody's realizing something new. Well, our basic population, our clients, are way behind us. You know, we can tell them, we're, if we're into aromatherapy, we tell them about aromatherapy. If we're into nutrition and supplements, we always tell them about that. But no one takes the time to step back and go, what's do proper body mechanics? What's do proper communication? Sometimes it's just a lot of what's going on. It's just the emotional stress and their posture and everything is being affected by the stress they're under. And taking that 15 minutes after the session to just let them talk, you know, you don't have, you know, just give them some place that's safe. That can make all the difference. Yeah, big time. Because um, also when I had my business too, I always um, gave them a heated rice pack and stuff afterwards. Just some way they can just kind of relax even more. So. Well, I'm lucky. I've set up, I have a home office. I have a, a Japanese sitting garden. I have a reception room. I have a pond out back with a hammock. So my clients know, even if for some reason I'm back to back or they came late and the next one came early because we all know they all come exactly when they're supposed to. Um, <laughs> I have to leave. Because, you know, and a lot of times, even in the big spas, the problem for the therapist is they're being booked back to back because they don't have control of that because they're working for somebody else's organization. Um, but at least when in those spa settings, they don't always have to run out the door. You can tell them, you know what, you can sit here for a while just because your session is over doesn't mean you have to leave. The other flip side to that are the clients that are already, before they're off the table and got their underwear back on, they're out the door or on the phone and their head is already gone with the million things they have to do, almost destroying half, you know, what you've done for that hour. And you try to explain to them, you know, you don't have to answer the phone. They will, but you try to get them to take this, you know, not jump right back in. Yep. Just like my clients walk in, they go, do you mind if I run to the bathroom? I'm like, well, you can walk. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true <laughs> yeah because the thing is sometimes they lose that whole effect of the massage too if they just get up and go right away and it's just you know i i truly feel that I, I don't really say that i'm a body worker when i'm a massage therapist and i i for lack of a better name i say i'm a human worker that i'm paying attention to all the aspects the emotional the stress the physical the biomechanics i'm trying to do the whole picture not just give them a massage and say, okay, thank you very much. Hope to see you next week or next month. I want to take the time to know my clients, understand my clients, and understand what's affecting them. Sometimes it could just be they're, in, they're having a really bad day with the, with the kids or the spouse, and they just need some place or someone else to vent it to, and that's great. Other times it's just they have no idea that they've been walking incorrectly, sleeping incorrectly, or that they're building it up with all the running around and going crazy because they feel they have no choice. But it's just that. It's a choice. Yes, that's definitely. And then, I, I, um, how do you bring them back to the whole massage? Let's say many hours afterwards. Is there anything you can recommend to them to kind of bring them back to that um, better feeling and stuff? Or oh yeah, um, there's a couple of things. For those who use aromatherapy, you can give the, the have them, you can give them the uh, oils or the scents or the candle that you were burning at that moment. Or if there's a specific music that you were playing that they really like, if you're like, I have I have uh, clients in this specific music that I that I know they like so I always play and what I've done is that either I told them get this CD or look on uh, Facebook or uh, for the music or here light this candle when you're feeling stressed do yourself a minute sit light the candle smell or if it's an essential oil that they have you know something to trigger back that minute that they can sit and relax the other thing that I really do is I, I do push meditation but not well, you have to sit there and go home oh, and clear your mind because most people have a problem with that. I do say, you got YouTube, got an iPad, look up a guided meditation. There's from one minute to two hours on there for free. 
take 15 minutes and just watch this. Find one that speaks to you and give yourself a break so that they can come back and remember they're supposed to relax. And all of that is going to bring them back to your practice because you've taken that time to give them the tools and they're going to want to come back and feel that how great they felt when they were here. Because if they lose it five minutes after they're out the door, they're not even going to think twice about coming back till they're in pain. Yeah, because because uh, I had that problem too. I mean, and sometimes I would preach and tell them blue to, blue in the face about doing these kind of things, but for them to actually do it, that's another thing. So, is there any way to kind of check to see that they're actually following through on these things? Or yeah, if you have the time, um, and if it's part of your practice, if you want to bring it into your practices, you can make a. I make. I have, everybody has their to do list. I have to do lists for all different things. I have my client to do list, and I might put in my book or on this one list call this person, email this person, check in with this person. If I have someone who's had an emotional release or I've done a lot of uh, physical work, whether with my scar tissue or my stretching, I will call them the next day and I'll be, how are you? You know, and then I'll, you know, and if they're not back or if they're not coming in, I will make sure that I call them. I have them on a list of when I'm supposed to call, check in with this person. It is time consuming, but it's also the personal touch to let them know that you're caring. You're not calling to look for another appointment for them. You're calling to see how they are doing. Don't even mention booking another appointment. You just want to know how they are. Yep. And is there any other ways too to get them? Oh sure. There's, right. um, you can you can do emails. You can do um, Facebook uh, if they're on your Facebook page. You can do newsletters. Um, all of those. Uh, some people send out reminder cards. I've kind of gone away from snail mail, but a lot of people still love to get things in the mail, so that always helps as well. And the other really nice thing you can do is email them a coupon. <laughs> this is just for you. I was thinking of you today. Here, this is a present for you. Here's a coupon with a smiley face on it. Yep, and, and then even with the actual physical mail, I mean, nobody gets that anymore, but just imagine how shocked they are if they actually get something. Oh, I love getting mail. So do my dogs, because they get to it before I do. <laughs> um, they tell me which one's junk and which is not. They go, here, you want to read this one. Um, I love getting mail. Um, I will, on occasion, when I have clients that have had it, I actually have, because everything's virtual, I have like uh, bluemountain.com or any one of the virtual uh, cards uh, sites where you can send uh, cards through the email. Um, I do that all the time. I will send the client a pick-me-up card, a funny card, a joke card through the email, but you can do it through the snail mail as well. And I'll even, on those, I'll say, hey, come on in, I'll give you a free paraffin, or come on in, we'll do some extra stretching, and uh, a little bit of stretching, with our, or if they're coming, they're stretching class, so come on in, I'll give you an extra little bit, we'll do some massage afterwards. I'll give them little incentives you know, uh, if I feel it's necessary, if they're not coming in for reasons other than they don't want to come in, they're coming in because what, they're not here because life is in the way, then I'll give an incentive. And then if somebody did have kind of emotional release during the treatment, I mean, afterwards, um, how do you go about um, dealing with that then? Um, during the emotional release or after the or, session? Yeah, or, even, even, even after the session, yeah. After the session, it's almost the same as what I said before. I will uh, give the client a time to come in, we'll sit, we'll talk, depending on the person, maybe I'll come right at it and say, so how are we doing, you know, what was going on, you know, do you want to talk about it, do you want to, you know, you, you know what did you experience, um, if it's another person who seems very embarrassed or doesn't want to do it, I'll just, I'll go a different way, I'm like, so how are you feeling, do you less stress, I'll use different uh, questions to let them know it's safe, but I'll never push if they're not going to give it, but I do let them know that, you know, if you if you ever feel like calling or talking, I'm always here. Um, there's it's a tricky sp uh, area with the emotional releases because this is another really big problem that I have with most of the schooling that we have out there is that we're told that our work elicits emotional releases, and we've all experienced clients either laughing, crying, having fits on the table of anger, not other fits. Um, <laughs> yep. And um, but we're told that we're not allowed to do anything about that because we're, it's not in our scope of practice. We're not trained psychologists or sociologists to, to be able to, to deal with that. But I think that's a mistake. We all need to take classes and learning how to properly handle it within the, right, the areas that we're allowed to go. There, Because there, you could say the wrong thing. Sometimes saying nothing can make it worse because maybe it's a, a big old male uh, you know, on the table who doesn't cry in front of people and he has a, a release where he's crying and if you say nothing, sometimes that can make him think embarrassed he never should have done that and he'll never do it again. 
Yeah, so could, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. We do need to add that to our schooling. Um, and if, you, if it's not in our schooling, we need to take classes because there are classes out there that teach us how to do the proper communication with that. Yeah, because I think a lot of times, too, with the schooling, I mean, there's not enough hours, especially for diploma. I mean, if an associate degree and stuff, you can sometimes get a little bit more of those business classes and um, communication classes and stuff, but, yeah. <laughs> That's like the whole thing I'm sure you were hearing at the Alliance. What is a standard practice? What is the scope? I actually was teaching uh, in Canada over in BC just a couple weeks ago, and they have a 3,000-hour program. And... They do an entire semester on dealing with boundaries and emotional issues. It's part of their curriculum. Wow. And it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I brought it up because when I bring this subject up when I'm teaching here in the States or even in, in Europe, they, you know, they're like, oh, yes, and then how do we do this and what would you do? And like, they were like, oh, we got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? I'm like, cool, tell me. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to stay and take the class. But they literally spent an entire semester of their programming, uh, of their programming, of their of their education, dealing with communications, dealing with uh, emotional releases, also setting boundaries for the therapist. I mean, we all have those issues with our clients. Some people don't like to call their clients because they're afraid they're interfering with their, you know, crossing boundaries to call to call their clients just to say how are you. But you can do it in a professional manner, and it's fine. Um, and you can tell if your client is annoyed by the phone call or likes it, and you might put a note, don't call again, you know, let them just be. Or then there's the ones who take it in reverse, and now you become their best friend. Um, so you have to be able to know how to handle the communication that you don't set yourself up in a situation where 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you're getting someone calling you, go, hey, I couldn't sleep, so I figured I'd call you. You, you don't want that either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or are, are showing up and coming home and they're in the hammock in your backyard. Hey, yeah. <laughs> hey you don't have an appointment. <laughs> and that stuff happens. Um, so it's, this is part of the training and the education that really I strongly, strongly believe has to be put into our school system and on top of uh, our training system, as well as if you haven't gotten it and you're out of school, to look for areas that deal with that. Because the, the thing is, you could be the best technical massage therapist out there. You could give the best massage ever that you hit everywhere. It's relaxing. It's great. But if you don't take the time to sit back and see what's going on emotionally with your client or, or with stress, you know, mentally or emotionally, you're missing the mark. Because I firmly believe that the majority of what's going on manifesting physically has a root in emotional or mental. And understanding that without getting into being a shrink or that, but understanding its effects on the body, that's the key to a really good treatment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, especially with students, too. I mean, when they get out in the field, they really feel connected to some clients, and they feel like they can be friends with them, too, and they think they can have the boundaries. But, I mean, it's so hard, I mean, to, to cut things off. That Yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to be for. I have a couple of clients that have been around for um, 17 years, and there are, like, several clients who consider my dogs to be their grand puppies. It's very amusing. Um you know, we've just been together for a very, very, very long time, and I am friends with them, but there's also, it's a friendship where you're exchanging money for services, so it's not quite what people want, and you have to understand that when it's a business, there is a, a, a boundary line there, and to go past that can cause problems unless you have a very uh, mature person who you're dealing with. And I think it's even harder, too, if they're in a small town massaging, they live there, too. Oh. Because... <laughs> yeah, a small town, everybody knows everybody. So you know all the secrets. I used to joke to my husband, I would, I have groups of people that all know each other. Like they refer to each other and they're all friends. I might know six of each other and go out. They all go to the same parties or host parties. And my husband's like, because you think that they would invite you. So you know all of them. Because one of them was talking to me about what the food and all of that. And I had given some suggestions. I go, I'm the last person they want at the party. And he's like, why? I said, I've seen them all naked. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like yeah. But like literally, I've seen and heard, and my mind is the safe room where they can say anything. The last thing they want is to see me hanging out in their backyard with all their friends, knowing I know everything there is to know about them, or that they have, or the, or the one father had one guy, male client, has kind of had the crying or the breakdown, you know, or the fact that one talked to me about the plastic surgery that no one else is supposed to know about. So you know, you can't always expect to be invited, you know, and sometimes it's not the right place for you to be. But, you know, again, I still know all of them, and we, you know, and we still, you know, it's a different type of relationship when you know that many clients that know each other. 
but you really should not be looking for your clients to be your friends to hang out with. You can be friendly and concerned and know about their families and they know about yours and you give a call, you make sure you send the birthday card if someone's sick. I just had a client whose uh, mother-in-law passed and I sent flowers and I called to check up on them. But I, you know, I did not go to the, uh, the wake because that really wasn't my place to be there. You know, whereas with another client, I actually did because I know I know the whole family. Uh -huh. So this depends. You have to be able to understand where your boundaries are with each person and whether this person is uh, what that person is. Is it a normal person? Is it an unstable person? You know, is it a needy person? Remember, you're in a place of power as a therapist. You shouldn't be, but just as with doctors, clients will give up their power to you, and then you become the old, all knowing. And it shouldn't be that way either. There, ha you have to understand what the boundaries are. And then, um, are you big per big uh, big proponent of giving homework to the clients to do at home? Or? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm actually, especially with the stretching that I do, I will send them home with whole routines and, and exercise to, uh, for them to do. Whether they do it or not, well, uh, that I can't control. However, as a practitioner, the benefit of doing that, or even if it's a massage and you went home and you sent them home with instructions for the sciatica, what to do if the sciatica flares up again. When they come in and, they com and they're complaining, why am I not getting better faster? Why am I not doing this? And I can turn around and say, well, did you, have you been doing your stretching? Have, have, did you do when this happened? Did you do as I suggest? So it, if they say no, well, then they can't blame you anymore. A lot, you know, so you, you, and you don't have to feel guilty that they're still in pain because you gave them the tools to help themselves. If they're not going to help themselves, you can help them when they're in your uh, treatment room. But once they're out of the treatment room, they have to take responsibility for themselves. So giving them homework is the best thing that you could possibly do. Even if it's like, look, if you're into herbs or if you're into uh, supplements and you're qualified to make those recommendations, by all means. Don't willy-nilly stuff that you're not qualified for, please. Yep. And then, and then also for, um, the, you, you said it's some kind of routines for stretching and stuff. I mean, would do you make them do it in front of you too? I mean, you show them how to do it and then just to make sure. Yeah, my stretching sessions go, uh, I can work on them, but I always try to have them, because my stretching is an active form of stretching. It's not a passive form of stretching. So they have to be working. And I'm more of a guide and assist to them. So they're learning and they're doing it the entire time. And I will actually, add, I'll, I might start a session. Okay, have you been doing the stretches that we did? And they'll say, yes. I go, well, show me. How is it, is it helping you? Is it not helping you? And they'll say, well, I haven't quite got it. It's not this. I'll be like, okay, show me what you were doing. Let's go over this. Um, I actually have clients where I'll teach them. I'll spend 10 minutes after a session walking around the, the office and the treatment room, retraining them how to walk. You know what would fix this walk, and I'll watch them coming up and down out of my uh, uh, from my all coming into my office. And if I see that they're still walking not the way we tried to correct, I'll immediately ask them, "Have you been trying to practice how to work, how to walk?" You know, sometimes life gets in the way, but if they say no, not at all, well then that's now you're putting it back on them. But yeah, you need to show them, you need to work with them, and have them demonstrate that they understand. It's, um, it also goes with that when you're taking any kind of class. It's one of my little um, bugaboos about people learning stuff from videos or online for hands-on uh, modalities. What someone says when I tell you to do something, if I ask you to lift your left hand and then you hear me say, no, your other left, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because how people perceive or understand what you're saying. With the stretching, I cue people. I give them specific cues to get them to move the way I want them to move. But I have to sometimes come up with six different ways to say that cue in order to get them to do what I want them to do because they're just not perceiving what I'm asking them to do. They're not understanding it. It's like the yoga instructor who never leaves the front of the room and the person says, well, I kind of look like what they're doing, but they're not doing at all what's required to be done because they don't understand. They have their, their body mind connection, the appropriate reception is completely skewed. So you need to actually have them show you if you've given them that. Um, sometimes I'll have a client who's having a weight issue and I'll just be like, well, let's just keep a, um, write down everything you eat and when you eat it. And if they're not keeping a log of what they're eating and they're really complaining over and over and over again about their weight, well then I said, the simple thing was to write everything down. And if we can't start with that, how are we going to work on the weight? You really need to work with them and have them show that they're doing the work. 
in order to get people to own up to what they need to do. And um, do you um, actually take pictures of them before and after for posture and stuff? or? Uh, no, I have a book of bill about that. Um, I think it's a great tool. Um, uh, I've always, everybody asks me that with my scar work. Do you do the before and after and with the stretching, the before and after? And I have a, a little bit of a boogaboo. Say, okay, stand still. Let me take a picture to show you how crappy you look. No, um, <laughs> uh, I obviously wouldn't say it that way. But I find that a lot of people who come in with pain or problems are already self-conscious or in too much pain to want to deal with something like that. I sometimes have, when someone comes in, a new client, to get them to fill out a history properly is too much time. So I really don't do that. If I'm in a class or if I have someone who's specifically coming in that I think would be willing to be like a project, you said it was going to be a long time, I would suggest, hey, do you want to take pictures? But I always have a problem with it because I feel like it's a little invasive, but that's my own personal thing. I know a lot of therapists who do it, and I think it's a great tool. I just always worry about what are they thinking when I ask that question? How bad am I that she thinks she needs to take a picture? Or on the flip side, there's the clients who don't want to see how bad they are. They only want to be happy in how good they've become. Uh, I've had clients say to me, oh, we should have taken before pictures. And I look at them and I go, and what would you have said if I had asked if I could take a picture? And they said, yeah, no, I wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> it, it. It all depends on the client, your read, and who you are. Some people are like, okay, we need to take a picture. And I'm just like, for me, it's not something I like to do because I think it just kind of trances into the emotional end that I still haven't quite gauged yet. Yep. And, and then um, do you even send, uh, let's say, through email um, any kind of videos to remind them about things, too, at all? Or? Uh, no, I haven't done that. I, said I have videos on YouTube of me teaching. I have and a couple individual things I haven't really gotten. I've been a little busy. Um, shooting video takes time. If um, I have had uh, parents or spouses come in with their own cameras and record the exercises. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> done that I have suggested that especially when kids are involved um, I'll have the parents come in and say okay or even not even a video camera says pick up your cell phone and record me doing this so I can explain to you how to do this besides the handouts that I give them then they can physically see me working with their kids they can physically see or their spouse or whoever it is that I'm working with that they're helping out um, and then there are also um, I have set up with the video camera I've had clients that it's just them They'll come in with the video camera and we'll record them stretching and me correcting so that they can remember and remind themselves besides having the ability to look on the YouTube. Yep. Yeah, because I can definitely see that helping in a way and stuff to, for just, I mean, some people are just so visual and stuff. And <laughs> we don't videotape the massage sessions, though. No, no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I mean, some people are saying that, I mean, there's debates about they should be drinking tons of water afterwards now and stuff like that um, with, with massage. And I mean, there's so many different things that are going on in the massage field, whether it's right or wrong. Or Well, this is, it's the same thing with the stretching. Should you stretch? Should we stretch? Is it beneficial? Isn't it? There was a big big on uh, the stretching recently, a couple months ago. Here's what I think. We are supposed to be drinking water all day long, whether it's you know, after the massage session, for the massage session, here's the fact is that we need to drink water. We need to be sipping water all day long. The rule of thumb is always half your body weight in ounces, or some people will now are now saying your whole body weight in ounces. And I say, you know what, this is what you do. Always have a bottle of water somewhere near you. Um, I have a bottle in my uh, office. I have a bottle in my living room. I have a bottle in the kitchen, anywhere I am, so I can just remember to drink because I actually like it room temperature. I'm not, I don't need it cold. But I do tell people that you should be drinking water all the time. Not, and, and, and drinking water in many ounces does not include your coffee, does not include your iced tea. I want you drinking this much water all day long, sipping it, not chugging it because that's in one end and out the other. <laughs> right. I want it to get down to your cells and sip. So do I say it in regard to the massage, you need to take a drink of water? The reason people tend to be thirsty after a massage, besides that you uh, move their circulation, they're actually relaxed in the fact and paying a little bit of attention to their body. So when their body says, hey, I'm thirsty, they want the water. Most of the time, by the time somebody's thirsty, they're already dehydrated. And they've just been ignoring it because they haven't had a chance to stop and take a drink. So it's not so much that I want them to drink because they've had a massage. It's that I want them to be drinking all the time. 
water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've known um, some therapists that are, they think it's a conflict of interest even recommending the clients to buy like self-help tools or things else um, at the place of business. And um, Well, I don't have a sales rack. In my, in my, I don't like sell things to my clients other than like things they can't get. Like I'll have bio freeze, you know, in the office or if they want that, if they like my candles, I have a bunch, but I don't charge extra. I just let them have, um, but I, if, if you believe in a product and, and you think it's going to be beneficial, I have no problem with you recommending that product. If you're recommending products just because you're trying to make a profit and add to your, your, um, uh, business. That's a choice you make. It's not something I would do, but again, that's someone's a business choice um, to do that. I think if you're going to recommend a product, though, especially if it's a self-help product, you really need to be an expert on that product, and you also have to know whether or not if that's truly the right product for your person, for your client, that you're recommending it to. Um, not everything works for everybody. That's why we have our big toolboxes with more than one technique. I don't just do one technique. I do a combination thereof. And I will recommend different things. I'll even recommend I have a network of, of different doctors and therapists that I think if any, I send a lot. I have a PT who does aquatic therapy. I'm sending my clients over there all the time because I believe in aquatic therapy. Um, uh, but it's like you have to, I do recommend, if you want to recommend products, if you believe in them, then by all means. But understand everything about that product before you do it and understand the personality that you're recommending it to. Is this person going to buy everything you tell them not because they worship you because you made them feel better? Or is this a product that you're just trying because you, you know, just make sure you understand before you recommend. That's, I guess, where I'm going. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then um, for people to get to know a little bit about you that don't know about you, um, what kind of classes do you offer then? Oh, let's see. Um, my main uh, specialty is uh, scar tissue release. Um, it's a form of fascial work, uh, that targets adhesions and scar tissue, um, not just superficial, but throughout the body. Uh, and I also teach therapy, uh, integrated therapeutic stretching, which is my take on active isolated stretching. I worked for years teaching that along with Aaron Madison. I kind of added it, and ended it with the scar tissue and developed a little bit, a few things here and there. Uh, and I'm currently hoping by 2013, I'm putting together a little, um, ethics class, which is basically, basically on what I mentioned earlier on uh, human works. In other words, I gotta get a better name than that because I know it sounds like human trafficking and I'm trying to stop that. I'll come up with it. Okay. <laughs> but it's basically talking about communications. Um, there's a lot of great communication classes out there also. Like Ruth Warner has several. There's really some great uh, communication classes out there, but I'm putting one for my take about how to approach body and mind and pull everything together and understand the effects and how to do basically what we were talking about today. How to, how to integrate it into your practice and how to really communicate with your client on all levels about all aspects. And any other classes or just those right now then you have? Uh, just those right now. I, I actually started putting together uh, a proprioceptive taping class, which is like a kinesio taping, but I'm not using kinesio. I'm actually working with rock tape. Um, but that's also in the works because it's, you know, I still also have a full-time practice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with the taping too, do you actually recommend... Um, I mean, do you give them enough that they can do it on their own, or do you have to have somebody else do it? Or? Uh, no, no, depending on what needs to be taped. I do show them how to tape uh, uh, on their own if they can. If there's a parent, I will show a parent or a spouse uh, how to do it. If it's an athlete, you know, if they, if they need to have it done and they want it, if the coach or the trainer for that team, whether it's school, high school, college, or whatever level, I'll go and show them if they ask me or if they bring their coaches in. I have a lot of athletes that... I'll say, bring your coach in, bring your trainer in. Let's show them this work, and I do, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll uh, you know, I'll give them some tape. But then, you know, if they really want to keep doing it, the tape is here, and I'll show them where to get it. Because um, I'm a firm believer in the appropriate receptive tape because it's a great um, supportive work. It's like your clients are leaving you, whether it's massage, whether it's stretching. Because you can do it after massage. You just got to take some alcohol and wipe down the oil if you've used oil or cream, and it gives like it's like your hands are still on them when they leave. And how long does that usually stay on the body then? <laughs> That's debatable. Um, it depends on the person, the skin type, and the tape that you're using. Um, certain tapes are much more sticky than other tapes, and they will stay longer, but there's a difference between each of them. Kinesio tape, I find personally, is a great tape. Um, and you not, it doesn't stay as long as, say, rock tape, but you, with kinesio, you're unaware that the tape is on you. Can eat, uh, rock tape, it's a, it's a firmer hold. It'll stay. It'll give you the support, but you are a little bit aware that you're wearing the tape. 
So it all depends on the person and how and what you want and what it is that you're looking for. Rock tape is more of a, a very good for sports. They have a, a waterproof tape as well, so it's great. But, you know, the Kinesio tape, the K-taping, there's a lot of different tapes out there. Um, you got to try and get them and play with them and see which ones you feel work better. Yep, and then and then also with, with the tape, I mean, it, would you say in the last few years it's really gotten really popular? Oh, yeah. The, the taping is, is, is uh, very, very, very popular right now. There's a lot of the Kinesio has really brought it out there, and now all the other companies are popping out there teaching it with different perspectives. That and also a lot of the, um, the muscle testing, like with David Weinstock, uh, Gray Cooks, uh, FMS, the functional movement screening, a lot of massage therapists are moving more towards incorporating body mechanics and proper exercise and proper testing, and, and, but in, and which is great because you're getting a better understanding of the body. Not to say that just someone coming in and doing a relaxation massage or a simple therapeutic massage without going into all the testing is incorrect. They both have their benefits. Yeah, definitely. And is there any other self-help things that you can recommend to clients afterwards? Or Well, uh, well I recommend uh, the meditation. I always recommend stretching. I recommend walking. <laughs> the other thing that I really do recommend is setting up, for a lot of my clients, is setting up timers on their computers um, to tell them to get up. I have this one client that I love to tell the story about as he came into me, called me up. Oh, I'm in so much pain, my sciatica. I, I can't even move. I can't get to you. I'm like, well, you got to get to me. And he came to me and I'm working on him. His sciatica was really bad. And I said, look, he's a, a, a mortgage broker in a bank. And I said to him, you know, you really have to start getting up from your desk like every, you know, 20, for you every 15 minutes you know, or every 20 minutes to a half hour and move and walk away. And he starts laughing. And I said, well, what's so funny? And he goes, well, the lights on his office are on motion detectors. And every hour and a half, he has to do this. Where's my camera? He has to go like this and wave his hand so the lights come back on. <laughs> I looked at him and I was like, seriously? That doesn't tell you that you're sitting so still working at your computer and not moving that you're not even discernible by your motion detectors? You know, so... I actually had him and I have a lot of clients set up a timer on their computer that tells them to get up um, or to record them. I'll put out a list of, you know, stand up, walk around the room. I have one that says that take a breath, smile. Like I, I put a whole bunch of suggestions that they could record and put onto their timers, onto their computer so that, you know, you know, I, I, for some of them I get goofy, you know, you know, think about eating a candy bar, a chocolate bar right now, you know. Or, you know, Ben and Jerry's. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> get them to laugh and smile and, you know, yes, we're working. Yes, we're focusing. Yes, we're concentrating. But there's times you need to step back, give your, bright, your body and your brain and your stress level a break, and then refresh and come back into it. And that's the kind of things that I give and suggestions and walks. And I also have all kinds of, it, depending on the situation, I have a client who has a parent who's going through Alzheimer's right now. So we went through all the suggestions of what to do in the house to keep the parent from uh, the, the the parent from freaking out. Like we have whiteboards throughout the house. But if if you're confused, read this, and it gives simple things that this person happens to tend to forget or get. You know, you're currently standing in the kitchen of your house, and we we we've, we've set up their house with that to help, which now takes the re the stress off my client that she's do she's got something that she can do for that parent. I'm always coming up with things for them to do. <laughs> <laughs> depends on the situation. That's the whole point of this conversation is that if you take the everybody's different. There's some basic suggestions, do a timer, take a walk, drink your water, stretch, you know, um, laugh, please, do something. Um, sign up for a joke of the day that comes on your on your email um, or, or meditation of the day. Um, own moment for the day, but then if I have clients with individual things, say the one with the Alzheimer's, you know, um, or, or that her parent has Alzheimer's, and we work on that, and, you know, we might be talking about also, you know, the parent, the guilt of having the fact that the parent is like this, or a parent who's ailing and has the guilt that the child is not taken care of, and we come up with all kinds of things. I've had one person where we had the grandchildren Skyping in and, and talking to the, the, the parent, the grandparent, Every day, there was like six grandchildren, and, and every day, one grandchild had to Skype in, talk to her, and it alleviated the grandparents' uh, depression. You find up ways. Just pay attention to who you're, you're, what's going on, and you can help figure out things to help them beyond the massage.
Yeah, because a lot of times, I mean, when they're when when we're done giving massages, we just think that's done, and they think that's done, kind of thing. But that's where everything starts. I think I would say. <laughs> it started before they walked in. It yeah. started while they were on the table, and thoughts and things were seeping into their heads. And you know whether the monkey mind was going, or you happened to touch an area that triggered a memory, um, or the whole thing that didn't hurt until you touched it, and now they're mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> Really? I caused it? I don't think so. Um, and, and then being able to, as soon as they get off the table, that's part of the sit down with them and being able to take the time, if you can, if it's your practice and you have the ability, to let them talk to you or reveal and then give you an insight that maybe you can give a suggestion. Um, the, the whole whiteboard thing with my client whose parent has Alzheimer's, she was like, that's bloody brilliant. And, and I said, it's, but it's, it's not that big a deal. The person's confused. Let them be able to find how are they going to not be confused when they get afraid in this? What, and my answer was that, and it's work. Um, it's helping them if you can and giving them a, a, someone who, like, a way of relieving stress, another stressor in their life. You know, even if it's like, you know, let, they, you know, let, the, let your husband take the kids to the movies for the night and give you a break. <laughs> yeah. right. Oh, by the way, he can wash his own underwear. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to do? They do. It all depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> and is there any other suggestions for the follow through or anything else? Uh, I think the main thing is, and the point that I'm trying to get is to pay attention, is to take the time, whether it's a follow up phone call the day after because they went through a lot on your table or they really they're sick and they're not doing well and you want to genuinely see how they're doing and let them know that you genuinely care. Because remember, in, in, there are places where we're considered part of the medical profession, which you know we would hope to be respected that way. But you want to show that there is someone who cares, it's because a lot of people with injuries and diseases, they're being treated, you know, as at times by the, the doctors don't even take the time to talk to them. You want to show that there is someone who's going to pay attention and listen, or whether it's emailing them. And if it's trying to make keep your schedule full, they're going to be there if you take the time to contact them, even if it's once a month with a personal email. You know, if you if you need your practice built up and you have that means you have the time to do the follow up for that, you can. Just being aware, keeping them in mind, and doing that one little thing, even if it's sending a funny email card to them. Hey, I was thinking of you. Sent you a smile. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's just going to brighten their day, you know. <laughs> but we're here to relieve stress and physically help them maintain balance. And maintain balance is not is not just the physical, it's the mental and the emotional. And if I can send somebody um, uh, a smile or make them laugh or giggle, because to me, laugh, if you don't laugh at least 10 times a day, you're seriously going to be getting sick by the end of the day. Um, you need it. It's and, and a little bit of humor, a little bit of laughter. For some people, it's just the fact that, hey, this person took the time. I mean, the whole thing of random, random acts of kindness. I'll walk up to someone in a store and I'll tell someone, I really like that sweater. And they'll be like, what? And they're like, oh, well, thank you. And like, there's a giant smile. It took me two seconds. You know, that's, you know, it's always out there to do that. But it's the same thing with your clients. If you take a minute, you know, even if you have to keep track of it on a notebook, remember to do this for this client. Do it because it's the right thing to do for them. And you will feel better that you took that time and everybody's going to want to see. And also, you doing that will also alleviate your stress as a practitioner. It can't just be about body in, body out. With my books, I got to order some more oil. I got to do this. You know, I got to advertise. It, you got to bring the human aspect in for yourself so that you can feel good about yourself. That that warm feeling, like in Scrooge at the end of the movie, everybody, you know, the heart grows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I really think you need to do a class of all the topic that we're covering and stuff, too. I mean, so many therapists would need this. Yeah, I'm definitely the, the, the goal for 2013. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I actually took some time off. I've been going nonstop for the last four years, and I took some time for myself. Um, but the goal is to not only get the, the ethics class together, it'll be like a six-hour class you know, with, with all that, is that I'm putting all of my classes together. Uh, we have new names for them that are coming out in 2013, and there will be a certification. Because even though I'm not a fan of the word certification, yeah. everybody seems to need one. Yep. So we're putting a certification together um, uh, so that everybody can have that extra piece of paper on their wall and feel good. I don't mean to be snide, but I feel that if you've learned the stuff, that piece of paper shouldn't make a difference. But Because um, there is no 
hopefully with the alliance now, they'll come up with a, a standard of what the word certification means, not a one-day certification versus a two-year certification, and you still have a piece of paper that just says you're certified. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit with that, but we will be putting that together, and we will be putting um, all kinds of fun things and uh, some maybe some clinic days where people can come in and bring their patients or themselves. Uh, we've been trying to do that now wherever I travel. I'm staying an extra day or two for clinic days. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, because part of the clinic and part of everything is to show how you have to combine everything. Well, that is very nice because, I mean, they're getting the core stuff in the classes and stuff, but this is, it steps it up a notch, definitely. Well, this is what I tell, I tell my students when they show up, whether it's for the stretching, whether it's for the scar work, I'm like, look, I'm going to give you the techniques. The techniques are awesome. You're going to love them, or maybe not, but either way, you're going <laughs> to understand them. And they're going to be a tool that you may use or be able to explain to other people what they are if you choose not to use it. But the brass ring, you know, that you're going to grab, the whole point, the thing that I'm trying to teach you, which goes across every technique that you've ever done, from massage to mild fascial to struck SI to um, Thai massage to any type cupping, anything that you do where you're working with a person is understanding the mind, body, emotional, mental connection how it's affecting your clients physically, and how it is that you can help and pay attention all within our scope of practice so that no one blow the booze on me. Um, and, and, and that's the brass ring, because that's what it's about, about bringing balance, just helping someone find balance. And what can, what can we see from you in the next few years then? <sighs> A big smile? <laughs> guys out there uh, as ebooks um, I'm trying to find a way to bring everything together another really goal for myself right now is as much as I love the continuing ed I'm finding a bit more of a pull to go more into the general population to make people more aware of the fact that you don't necessarily need that surgery and oh yes that 98% of all surgery abdominal and pelvic surgeries results in adhesions and scar tissue no one told you that before you had the surgery or after the surgery um, I really am uh, really feeling a strong pull to uh, enlightening the public, which will only help our profession. <clears throat> the problem is, is the public looks for the magic pill or the doctor or they're misinformed or uninformed by the medical community. And I think it's time that the people start to really, the general population really understands and has a better idea of really what's going on with their body and that they that 90% that of all surgery in this country is elective. Only 85% of the people having it done know that. Wow. <laughs> they believe because they're told this is what you need to do to get out of pain. There's no other options. Surgeons cut uh, ear, nose, and throat. Guys, look at your ear, nose, and throat. Knee, uh, you know, knee people look at your knees. The podiatrists look at your feet. You know, everybody specializes, and no one takes a step back and say there's other ways. There's holistic ways. There's healthy ways. There's options before the pills and and the surgeries, or there's ways to get through the surgery and, and deal with the the effects of the surgery before and after. They're out there, and people are not aware of it. So I'm feeling a very big need to go more into the mainstream and talk with that. But over the years, you'll see that, and you'll see me pulling more. Hopefully, I may put a DVD series together. Um, I may write another book. I don't know. I'm just kind of playing it by ear right now and seeing what's falling in front of me. Right now, it's the pull. Besides getting uh, more quality education for our continuing ed and trying to get our therapists to take continuing education because they want to, not because they have to, because they want the credits um, and to take classes that are going to make a difference in their practice and with them uh, and hopefully they enjoy my classes because of that. Um, it's more trying to just pull it all together and uh, help everybody overall. I think if the general population understands really what they can do, it's only better for all of the professions like ours where they'll seek us out. And is there any place that people can see you in person this year? This year, still left? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Let's see, we have, well, we're here in New York on Long Island. Where else am I going to be? I'm up in Rochester, New York. I'll be in Minnesota. Um, I will be in Vermont in October, as well as Idaho and back up in Canada. Um, November, I'm in, in Kentucky and Lexington, uh, and also back at the Cotiva Institute in Pennsylvania. So for this year, I'm going to be all around. If they want to find out more about the classes, for this year and what's coming in next year, we've got, I'm um, going to be going to Germany and a whole bunch of other places. Um, they can go to the website, which is currently brookseminars.com, but if you want to keep posted, there's going to be new websites all redone, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, we're having them worked on. Or they can go to the Facebook page, Brook Seminars, 
uh, bodywork education, please come to the Facebook page, uh, not because I need you to like me, um, but because we have <laughs> really, really great conversations about what we were talking about today. I post the latest information. When I see other really good posts, I repost them. And it's an open forum for everybody. We have Kairos. We have PTs. We have um, uh, um, coaches, athletes. We have all different types of people and every type of modality therapist in the massage world. So if you ask a question, you will get an answer from everybody, um, just like on Ryan's on Massage Nerd page. It's a really good place to come for conversations as well. Uh, and I post my classes there. Uh, or you could just give me a call if you got a good joke. And we'll talk a little bit. I'll answer any question that you want. <laughs> and when, when are you coming to Minnesota? Uh, September with the wonderful Miss Stephanie Lash. Okay, cool. I should definitely, yeah. I should definitely get up there during that time. And yes, we would love to have you yep. there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Marjorie. It's been a pleasure, and you're the best in the business. <laughs> oh, well, no, you are. No, you are. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>